Hi everybody. In this video, we're going to talk about generic programming. This is the idea that we want to write a single function that we can reuse many times in different contexts. So to understand the idea, let's go back to thinking about a random walk again. We want to simulate the trajectory of a random walk, that is its motion in time. So suppose that we have a walker which starts at position zero and lives on the integers and jumps left or right with probability one half at each time step. You would probably write something like the following. We're going to write a function called jump, which just chooses a random direction left or right with probability one half, just like we've done before. And then we would write something like this 1D trajectory function that takes in the time capital T that we want to run the simulation for. The walker has a single variable X, which is an integer, which will start at zero and will accumulate its positions in this variable called traj for trajectory. And initially it will be a vector that just contains the current value of X, which is zero. Then we'll do a loop over all times. And at each step, we'll modify the position of this particle by adding this random jump. And then we're going to store the current value of X in this, uh, in this variable called traj, and we'll return the trajectory at the end of the function. And we can uh, run the function and we see that it works. But what if we want now a two dimensional random walker that can jump in X and Y? The obvious thing to do is to copy this code and paste it and modify it appropriately. So now we would have positions X and Y, we would have coordinates X and Y that we want to store, we modify X and Y at each step, etc. And you can see that, well, basically this is the same function, but now we have this extra piece of information that we're in two dimensions. It feels like we as human beings are doing this work of manually copying and modifying something that the computer should actually be able to do for us. So how can we actually write a generic version of this code that works for a walker in any number of dimensions or at least one and two dimensions? So what we need to do is analyze the function and see what is it actually doing and try and break it down into smaller pieces, which we can then define for each different situation that we want to study. Basically, the idea is to write the code only once and reuse it in different situations. We can think of this as making it an abstraction, the underlying structure of this function. So let's analyze the verb. As in a previous video, we can think about verbs and nouns. So here we have nouns, which are the random walker objects, and they are moving around and we want to calculate the trajectory. And that calculation of the trajectory is a verb. We want to do that to the objects. We're going to rewrite the function by splitting out the functionality into separate functions. So let's have a function called initial position, which just returns zero for now. And we'll have a function move, which accepts the current value of X and makes it jump. So returns the new value of X. Now we can rewrite our trajectory function. It's now going to call this initial position function and call the move function. And so the trajectory function is now basically just the bookkeeping of storing these values and calling the right functions to make the walker move. But if we look at this function, we realize that actually we don't ever say that the walker lives in one dimension. If we were to change to modify the initial position function and the move function, we could actually have a walker in two dimensions. So for example, if we do initialize 2D and we return a tuple of two positions, X and Y coordinates, and move 2D takes in a tuple and returns a new tuple after both X and Y have jumped, then if we can tell trajectory to use these functions instead of the initialize and move functions that were already defined, we will actually have a two-dimensional walker. So how could we do that? And so the trick is that, well, if we look at the trajectory function, what we want to do is tell it Oh, this initial position function that you're calling, I actually want to replace that with a different function. And so the way we do that is to pass in the functions as arguments to the trajectory function. So here is the new version of the trajectory function, and we're passing in initialize and move as parameters to this function. So now when I call initialize as a function, it will actually call whichever function I pass in as an argument to trajectory. So let's try that out. If I call trajectory, with the functions that I defined globally before that correspond to moving the one-dimensional walker, indeed, I get the trajectory of a one-dimensional walker. However, if I now pass in these two-dimensional functions, I get the trajectory of a two-dimensional walker. So it's returning a vector of tuples now. So we see that this single version of trajectory can do two very different things, depending just on 
how I write these initialize and move functions. So this is really an example of generic programming. What Julia is doing is actually compiling two completely separate versions of this function trajectory that work in these two separate contexts. And this function trajectory is very general. As an example, you can make a kind of walker that computes the powers of two starting at one just by defining suitable initialize and move functions. So far, though, we've only analyzed the verb. And if you look, the information about the walker itself is actually kind of hidden in these functions. It's not very explicit. So how can we make it more explicit? If you think about it, what we want to do is have types. We want to define a new struct, a new user-defined type, which represents a one-dimensional walker and another one that is a two-dimensional walker. We've already seen how to use types, so let's define a struct called walker1d, which contains the position of that walker, and then we'll just define move to accept an object of that type. So again, we use this colon colon type annotation operator to specify that this version of the move function should only operate on objects of type walker1d, which is the type we've just defined. How do we move a walker1d? We're actually going to create a new walker1d object with the new position. This is actually an efficient thing to do in Julia because this is an immutable struct. It's a struct that cannot change, so I'm actually just creating a new copy at each step. And now I need a new version of the trajectory function which accepts this walker object everything is in terms of that walker object instead of explicitly the position. And so if I create a walker1d object and then I call the new version of trajectory with that object w, we see that indeed we have a random walk and at each step we have this walker1d at position minus three, for example. Of course, if you now want to plot the trajectory, you'll need to extract the position from those intermediate objects, or you could just store the position of the walker instead of this whole object. And similarly, if we want a two-dimensional walker, all we need to do is define the walker object and how it will move. In this case, we're just jumping in each separate direction. The initialization is actually coming from calling the constructor to initialize the object. And when we run trajectory of 20 with this W2 object, we see that indeed we have the trajectory of a two-dimensional random walker. So what about a walker in n dimensions? Which data structure would you use for the walker's position? And actually a good solution for this is this static arrays package. So to summarize, we've seen that Julia enables generic programming very nicely. We can write functions like this trajectory function, which are completely generic. This refers to any object W, as long as that object knows how to move. In other words, if there's a version of the function move defined on that object w. And as we said, Julia will compile a separate efficient version of this function trajectory for each different type w. This is really a key point about the Julia language that enables us to write compact readable code that is nonetheless efficient because it's being compiled into separate versions for each different type that we pass in. See you next time.